Hello, and welcome to my session, Measuring DevOps Success with Pipeline Analytics. First, before I start, putting events like this together are a lot of work. So please thank everybody who is a part of organizing the Automation Summit, because it's stressful. I've, I've done a few of those. But also, thank you for taking your time to join my session. I really appreciate that. There's a lot of content content out there, a lot of great information. It's hard to choose where to spend your time. And you're here, so that's great. Before I begin, I wanna put you in this mindset and think about a hypothetical scenario. Maybe it's not hypothetical for you. That would be pretty awesome. Let's imagine Splunk or somebody came to you and said, hey, we have this McLaren F1 race car. It's yours to drive. Take it, do whatever you want with it. That's exciting. But you look down and you realize there's no helmet and there's no safety harness. And you look in front of you and it's been placed on a country dirt road. Now, there might be some of you out there who think, oh, this is fantastic. I'm, I'm totally taking advantage of this. Me personally, I think the country dirt road is the most disturbing part because that'd be kind of bumpy. But I think most of us are going to feel a little bit uncomfortable driving one of the fastest pieces of machinery on ground out there. And that's what we're talking about today. Because if you take a moment and think back to the DevOps conversations you've had, conversations about the delivery chain, most of the focus is on velocity, automation, and speed, getting code out the door faster. Now, sometimes you talk about testing, but it's usually in the context, of how do we test more faster? And that is fantastic because that's absolutely the goal. But to sustain velocity, you have to think more strategically. And what I've seen a lot of organizations do is invest heavily in automation. And then in one, two years, now I have a good understanding of what that automation has even done for them. So we're about to talk about pipeline analytics, which is a way to create guardrails and support that velocity. My name is Chris Riley. I am a senior technology advocate in developer relations at Splunk. What does that mean? Well, basically means my career as a software developer was not fantastic. I was not the best developer on the world. You know, I, I shouldn't be so harsh on myself. I was good at prototyping. But I could not give up the practice of building applications. I loved that. I loved the process. I loved the, the trying to build better quality software faster. So I spend a lot of my time engaging with large enterprises who still have monolithic applications and just starting to think about the cloud. And those unicorns out there that have been cloud native from day one and nearly 100% automated. I can't say I've encountered anybody who's 100% automated, but close. And I, I, I work to understand how they're embracing practices of SRE, observability, DevSecOps. And I bring that knowledge back also to Splunk to find out how we can align our capabilities in those use cases. If you want to find out more about me, you can scan that QR code, get access to my information, even if it's to debate me. Those are always fun conversations if you disagree with something that I've heard or you, you hear in this session. But I always like engaging with people who join my session. So back to like what I tend to talk about a lot. I group it all into this category called code to cloud visibility. What is code to cloud visibility? It's not just a marketing term, even though I think it sounds... Pretty cool. It's this concept of how do you measure from the point a feature is defined in your ticketing system to the point that feature is running in production every step of the way, such that you have so much visibility that you can bring that data together, weave a thread through your entire environment, and use it to improve communication, to improve security, et cetera. So code to cloud visibility, just like test coverage, when you measure test coverage for unit testing or functional testing, can actually be a metric. And each organization is going to probably start in a different area, the area that is most concerning or, or biggest challenges for them. 
Now, code to cloud visibility breaks into observability, which is a new cool kid term for monitoring, essentially. If you're really cool, you call it OLLI or O11Y, but it's the practice of monitoring dealing with a very specific problem set, which is cloud native distributed applications, because it is a different problem set and we need a term and techniques to describe them. It also consists of DevSecOps, how we consider security in the delivery chain itself, which is directly related to the topic today, which is pipeline analytics. Code to cloud visibility is essential because we still live in silos. And as a matter of fact, I found that automation actually increases the silos. It is so successful to automate that we don't have to talk to each other. We don't have to collaborate. We don't necessarily need to share information. So silos still exist largely in most organizations, even though the whole point of DevOps was kind of break that. Now, I'm sure you've seen the infinity DevOps symbol. What's really interesting is most organizations treat their delivery chain as a linear thing, like we see here. You go from planning, to building, to testing, to prod. What most environments are lacking is that feedback loop. And I just didn't draw it here because it's hard to get those on PowerPoint. That feedback loop is absolutely critical. Taking what has happened in production in influencing the product backlog, but also learning from it and tying it to business value. There's no way to do that with silos because not everybody's speaking the same language. And trying to translate across teams comes at a huge cost, often referred to as toil. So when a security professional just wants to know what developers are doing, most of the time they have to stop everything to learn because they can't just go and look at the developer dashboards, which the developers understand, and have confidence that they understand what's going on. But also the silos impact organizations because you're losing context, you're losing information. At every wall here, you are losing a tremendous amount of information that can improve the quality of the applications in production. It's context, it helps with security incidents, it helps troubleshooting, it helps everything. So these walls come at a tremendous cost and they impact everybody. And I, you, can inter, you can interact with developers a lot and, and they just don't think that it's a problem. But also when you ask a developer, have they delayed a sprint this year? Most of them will say yes. So the concept that I want everybody to agree with me, and it's kind of the foundation of everything I'm gonna talk from here on out, is that your delivery chain is the application of applications, is your meta application. It's kind of a cool concept because it means that all the things that you're used to doing with your applications in production, you apply to the delivery chain itself. And most organizations truly are working this way. They script their infrastructure. They have automated pipelines. They're using GetOps. These are all concepts of building a product. The forward-looking organizations actually have product owners in their delivery chain. They have feature backlogs. They treat their developers as customers. They have versions, essentially, that they deliver to the organization. And the price of the version is having engineering teams and SREs do the right thing. So if your delivery chain is an application, application of applications, meta application, that means that it must be operable. If it's down, that's a problem, no code ships. It must be securable. It's a part of your attack surface. You have to secure it, just like an application in production. It must be measurable. You need to know whether you're doing a good job or not. You have to have KPIs for your delivery process as well. And by doing this and truly embracing code to cloud visibility and treating the entire environment from the point of features defined to the point it's running in production is how you weave a thread from your delivery chain through all layers in your tech stack and your SIM 
where you secure the application in production and hopefully back again. So this is why we invest in the concept around pipeline analytics. Because again, if your delivery chain is down, no code ships. Your delivery chain is a part of your attack surface. And we have seen a rise in delivery chain attacks where people are trying to exploit the delivery chain such that once the application ends up in production, they're able to exploit the application. You don't have to look far in the news and very recently in the news to see this happening in various ways. To speak the same language because translating across teams is expensive, it takes a lot of time, and it delays sprints. It, it prevents developers to do from doing what they want to do, which is build functionality. To measure business value, your organization, your CFO, your CEO, wants to invest heavily in building applications, but they need you to tell them how it's impacting the business and why they should be investing heavily. Most developers don't think that aligning to the business is their problem, but it is. And if you think about career development and if you wanna become an engineering manager or you wanna move into DevOps or other areas in engineering, you truly need to understand this because your organization whether you're selling an application or you're just engaging more with your customers via applications, oops, <laughs> is relying on this to support the business. And you should understand how. The other thing is technical debt exists. It exists in all environments. Sometimes it's, it exists from the day you write the feature, depending on what you're doing. And we just kind of know that this is a part of healthy development and engineering practices to address technical debt. A lot of organizations will dedicate whole sprints or multiple sprints just to removing technical debt. But sometimes it's even difficult to know where it is. So pipeline analytics helps you ongoing spot the areas of technical debt looking at things like aging branches and aging repositories. They could all be creating risk or problems within your organization. And then you've, I'm sure you've heard this term shift left. And if you're a developer, a lot of times you hear this term and you think you're gonna give me more work. I'm already busy addressing bugs and issues. And now you want me to do more work. Well, if your organization is approaching shift left by adding responsibility to developers, that could be a problem. Developers should be more aware and more accountable, but it doesn't mean that you give them more work. They need to build functionality. No, shift left doesn't mean that. Shift left simply means that those considerations that you typically reserve for production, like visibility and security, you move earlier in the delivery chain such that they cost less and you can catch issues sooner which also means they cost less because the impact of them is less in the delivery chain versus when they're actually touching the user. So you can't shift left without visibility and automation. It's simply not possible. It's not a thing that you should be doing. And pipeline analytics facilitates that without adding more work. Because if you're adding more work, you're just shooting yourself in the foot for building more functionality. So that's what pipeline analytics is. And hopefully I've convinced you that it's an important practice. So the obvious next question is, well, how do you, how do, you do this? And you may be thinking that it's difficult. The cool thing is it's not that difficult. Again, you're used to already doing this for applications that you support in production. And there's a good chance that the tooling you use today already can get you 80% of the way. So what is that other 20%? That other 20% is not technology necessarily, it's strategy. You have to decide what you wanna measure, what you wanna focus on, how you wanna visualize it, how you wanna share it. And that strategy is important with observability, it's important with everything you do. And part of it is also culture. So somebody in the organization, I can't decide for you to do the right thing and be strategic. I can tell you that the tools are not gonna solve the problem if you're not strategic. Somebody in your organization has to drive that strategy. Once you get to the technical implementation of pipeline analytics, 
it's pretty straightforward, almost trivial. All of the tools in your tool chain produce signals. Those signals tend to be available and exportable in the form of logs and APIs. And you can get metrics, you can get all sorts of data from these tools. For example, Jenkins logs happen to be some of the most verbose logs I've ever seen. They give a huge wealth of data. That can be good and bad. It can be good because of the richness of what's there. It can be bad because it's hard to know where to start and you have to be very focused when you do this. You can't just visualize everything because you have it. And also, you know, storage considerations. So you have to collect that data. There's basically, you know, three primary ways to do that, which we'll discuss. Next, this becomes really powerful when you correlate the data. So the typical sources of data are your ticketing system, your repositories, your release automation system, and potentially your incident response tool. That's normally what you're going to see as the primary tools for pipeline analytics. Now you can come up with metrics with a single tool. For example, I can use my release automation tool to come up with a lot of the key metrics. But once I correlate that with my ticketing system, for example, it becomes much more powerful. So thinking about that correlation is an interesting challenge and it becomes, adds a lot of value to what you're doing. And then of course, observe, monitor, right? You build dashboards, you build dashboards, typically for those three use cases I said, operate, monitor, and audit comply. Or sorry, operate, which is monitor, measure, which is business value, and audit and comply. So on the data collection side, you can get data from logs, a lot of tools, especially on-prem tools or self-managed tools produce logs. So you can get that log data in. You can get it from a REST API. So a lot of them have API gateways. They have API keys. You can access APIs and collect the data there. Or you can get them from web, webhooks. So actual events that happen inside the system fire and you pull that webhook data in. Each of these have pros and cons and you actually really have to think about this early on. So logs are the most verbose, but they're also the heaviest, both in terms of querying and, and finding data in, but also the sheer size, the storage size, but they give you the most data. REST APIs are great, um, make it very easy to pull in data, but oftentimes you're limited on the amount of data or more limited and querying historically can be challenging and day forward uh, information. You have to create the architecture, the event-based architecture yourself to do that. Webhooks are only day forward, generally. Right? You're only going to get day forward data, so you better start today because um, you can't. You have no opportunity to measure what you haven't collected, so you have to collect it today. In most organizations, you're going to have some combination of all of these. But it's not just how you collect the data that you have to think about. You have to think about your information architecture. Simple things like, how do you name your repositories? When, when I talk about the 80-20 rule, <laughs> getting started at 80%, you probably can do it with the tools you have today. That additional 20% is stuff that you should have already thought about, which is naming conventions. Are you putting your ticket numbers in your commit messages so I can correlate across tickets. And that ends up in my pipelines as well. It's not necessarily fun unless you're crazy like me who really likes organizing information, but it's something you have to consider. How your teams are named, how your, app, um, your applications are named, how your services are named, um, repos are named, your branches are named, like all of this matters. The other thing that can be really challenging for organizations is tool sprawl. Now, if you're in a large enterprise, you probably have almost every tool out there in the DevOps world. That happens. It's a form of, it's, 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 a, it's its own form of technical debt. That happens. Organizations should be fairly deliberate about removing that. And depending on the size of your organization, maybe you have a shared services or who's working on this, but you should try to refine that. If you don't have that luxury, the most successful, the way to be most successful with pipeline analytics is to focus 
on the most common tools and work on culture via dojos and, and other things to pull people in that direction. And actually pipeline analytics can be used as that tool because oftentimes if you show powerful dashboards, people are gonna wanna know how you got there. And the answer might be, well, you gotta use this stack or these tools in order to get there. So like I said, once we have the data, once we're aggregating the data, we're bringing it all in and we get to the point of observing, we're gonna do it in three use cases, monitor, measure, which is business value, and audit, which correlates directly to DevSecOps. Most organizations will actually have a lens or view in each of these. So if I am a security professional, I consider, or I'm most interested in the audit view. If I am a DevOps engineer, I'm most interested in the monitor view, but potentially the measurement as well. This is good for me to understand the impact on the business. If I'm an engineering manager, I'm probably most interested in the measure view. So it comes together really nicely. And the thing is, the data source tends to be the same across all of these. So how we're breaking visibility silos is we are just creating different lenses. Everybody is looking at the same data, which is super powerful and saves a lot of time and toil and translation. So when we think about monitoring, we're actually considering all the stuff that we typically consider for production. This is most important when you have self-managed infrastructure. It's important in the cloud as well, but all the largest cloud providers have automation tools for delivery chains, et cetera. And the monitoring and the uptime of those tools is generally offloaded to them. But there's a good chance that you're managing your own infrastructure as code with a tool like Terraform, or you're managing your own Jenkins cluster, um, et cetera, then you are responsible for the uptime of those tools. If it's down, code does not ship. So what you're going to do is get system metrics, both infrastructure and ideally application, but that's fairly rare. First thing you're gonna do is, is it up, is it down? That's fairly standard. A lot of organizations, the DevOps engineering team will actually have status pages just for the delivery chain so that people know the Jenkins server, is it healthy? And then they can use that to understand what might be happening if there's latency in their build or whatever, or if there's failed builds, et cetera. The next thing you're gonna look at is the actual infrastructure metrics, the metrics for the infrastructure that is running these tools, Terraform, Jenkins, Artifactory, et cetera. Fairly standard. Um, you're gonna look at your typical infrastructure metrics, memory, CPU, disk, network IO, but also use metrics, utilization, saturation, and errors to look at things like latency because latency can be signs of degradation in the service that you have to address later. If you can get the application layer and some of the tools like um, Spinnaker, for example, via the API gateway, you can actually get application level, do APM, application performance monitoring type investigation on your tools. You're gonna to use something like red metrics, rate, error, and duration. These are all really important. So think of like, if you're using HashiVault for provisioning secrets, you wanna know what the average time it takes to provision a secret. And if you get an anomaly, then that could be a sign of something potentially going wrong you already know how to do this, or somebody in your organization already knows how to do this. You are applying the same concepts that you do for your production application on the tools in your tool chain. The next one is how pipeline analytics facilitates DevSecOps or a portion of DevSecOps, which is building more secure applications, securing the software factory. There is a lot of type of data you can get here where, where the monitoring is kind of straightforward, pretty much the same for every organization. Audit and compliance is gonna start with these key metrics, which is the same for every organization, but it can deviate very quickly. So let me first talk about these metrics. All of these metrics are around identifying who is using the tooling, when they're using it, 
how they're using it and where they're using it from. So let's say that you have a named user, a known user who is running a deployment, a build, but from out of the country, Ukraine. You know all your developers are here, so what's going on? Why are you getting a request to do this or access to do this from outside the country? That might be a problem. That might be an indication that somebody has gained access to that account and running builds and injecting malicious code. So you wanna know who's accessing it from where, you wanna know what policies they're accessing it from. If somebody's trying to generate a secret for a root policy, well, that's generally not something that should happen. You don't wanna give access to root to all of your instances. So that is the foundational thing to protect your delivery chain, the outside attackers in your delivery chain. But there's other things that you need to think about, and it could be coming from the delivery chain, your developers themselves, maybe making mistakes, like putting a secrets in a commit message, or environment parity is typically a problem where vulnerabilities on the developer machine somehow make their way into production. One that was uh, recently the result of an attack was somebody pulling a image from a public repo, which they thought was fine because it's efficiency on the development machine, but that image had a known vulnerability and ended up in production. So maybe you wanna prevent people from pulling images from public re registries and only your private register. And that's something the organization has to decide. So your job is to leverage this to spot anomalies, anomalous behavior, but also give your security professionals more context on what is happening in the delivery chain to secure the application. Like, are we doing vulnerability scans? Have we identified vulnerabilities, but we're still um, pushing code to production? Also, they have confidence and do not need to disrupt the development team and actually support velocity. So these two are not that fun. I mean, they, they're fun for some. They're certainly fun because they allow us to go fast. They allow us to give the guardrails for developers to focus on what they want to do without being disrupted and having to explain their dashboards to somebody else. But the one that people get the most excited about and tends to be the most fun is knowing the meaning of good, aligning with business value. Now, similar to the audit and comply, there's kind of some standard, I'll call them standard in quotes, metrics here that organizations use. But this deviates really quickly. And that's part of the challenge because you have to decide what matters to you. Don't go and try to visualize the world and create dashboards for all data that you have because you're going to spend all your time doing that and you're not going to get much value from it. And you may find out that you did it wrong because it didn't support the organization's value. So the first thing you have to do is choose what you're going to measure. Um, I will work with organizations constantly and say, pick one metric. That's it. One metric. And here in a second, I'll explain where most people start. Second is you have to make sure you have the data. That was part of step one, right? Make sure you have the data in a consumable fashion that you can visualize this data. Is it measurable? Is this something that we can actually measure? Do we have the automation and the tools to do it? Some part of this implies you have to have the automation because what you're measuring is not just the activity of the tool itself. You're measuring the activity of the automation as well. How long... How long deployments take, things of that sort. So there's this idea called the DORA metrics. There's also something called flow metrics. Both of these are attempt to be a guide, possibly a standard that you can follow to get started. And they're all, they're, they're very useful. What I would say is that they're not an ends. There is more, and some organizations may need to start somewhere else. So the DORA metrics are largely focused on velocity, measuring velocity and success of your delivery chain. You're going to look at deployment frequency. How fast are we deploying code? Lead time to change. How long does it take from a feature to be defined 
to that feature happening in production. Change failure rate. How often does a feature that is defined ends up in production and as a result of an issue or a bug? And mean time to recovery, mean time to detect. We're very used to that. Most organizations start there. Mean time to recovery can be inferred from your ticketing system, but ideally an incident response tool, a true on-call incident response tool, because ticketing systems tend not to be as accurate as incident response processes are. There's a lot of reasons you might close a ticket that have nothing to do with the actual resolution. That is where most people start. Dora metrics are good for to be a North Star for all um, organizations. Now, how you visualize these matters a lot. Because, for example, deployment frequency. If you're building a back end, you are not going to be deploying it as frequently as a front end, especially if you have canary releases. So you have to think about this because those are not one and the same. And if you try to quantify your back end engineering team to metrics that really impact the front end engineering team, it's gonna cause some grumbles and frustrations. You really have to think about this. And I think that that's a key point is that a lot of this has nothing to do with tools and technology. It has to do about being smart about how you display it. Now, some of the other metrics that I'm really excited about are work in progress. Like how much work do you have that is being worked on now? And that um, it's kind of like uh, bandwidth in a way. You're kind of measuring the bandwidth. It's also a flow metric. Cost of downtime. How much does it cost you to be down? This could be toil. It could be dollar amount if you're selling an application. Amount of unplanned work. How much time are your developers spending not building new functionality on toil? Activity by repo and artifact. Like, what is the activity? What is our most active service that our developers are focusing on? And I also like looking at our branches, aging summaries of our repository to make sure our repository is healthy as well. So all of these are really powerful and there's like 20 others. So you have to be really strategic in what you decide to measure. And usually you decide by looking at your code to cloud visibility metric, finding out where you're weak is the most problematic, or you pick the low hanging fruit. The low hanging fruit tends to be MTTR. If you have a true good incident response strategy, you should be able to quantify MTTR and use that as a tool to get people interested, but also improve. What can we do to reduce our MTTR, the amount of time it takes us to resolve an incident? Some organizations are more concerned about mean time to detect. How long does it take for us to even identify an issue to get that event? So they will focus on that as well. Here's two examples. And I really wanna emphasize that, again, this is not that difficult and, and there's somewhat of a standard here. So the top left is MTTR, cost of un, um, downtime, amount of unplanned work, all focused on what is happening in production with the application. And then this other view is with Spinnaker, looking at what is our deployment frequency? Um, in the compliance center, who is doing deployments, from where, from what policy, how long are they taking? And you can also, you'll see at the top there, there's these other views, which are around operate, measure, and audit, and comply. So hopefully that gives you a really good sense of, of what you can do, and you can start today. I'm, I'm pretty sure that in your organization, you have the capabilities to start this today. You have to consider all the things I said around strategy. And, and sometimes this gets kind of frustrating when, when somebody says, hey, you should do this. This is great. You got it, but you got to think about it. Well, this should be true with everything that you do, because the more you strategize, the less grumbles and pain you have down the road. So here's the first consideration. There is no easy button in terms of strategy. If you have a logging tool, if you have the capability to visualize logs and metrics, then you have the beginnings of what you need to collect data from the tooling and start visualizing very quickly. That's the 80%. 
That 20%, that strategy, deciding what to measure, how you're going to communicate it in the organization, how you're going to visualize it, what the potential risks of having, for example, developer scoreboards, that sounds fun. It can be bad on culture. So you have to think about this stuff. Your deployment strategy will influence how you measure this. For example, a failure, if you do canary releases, is different than a failure if you do sprints. A lot of organizations will not consider it a failure if you do a deployment in an AB or a canary release, because that's the point of releasing that quickly, is to catch issues and do a rollback automatically. That is not necessarily considered a failure. Automation is somewhat of a prerequisite. Like I said before, you're visualizing the signals and the data from your tools in your tool chain, but also the automation that connects those tools. So automation is a prerequisite in that it is a source of data. So you should always be working towards automating 100%. Nobody's 100% that I've really seen. Some very, very close, and there's a few unicorns out there that are, but you're always working towards that as a goal. And you're collecting the data from your automation as well, logs in the automation. And start with one metric. Don't just try to visualize everything because you have it. It's going to take you too long to get to value. You need to present this and make it valuable to your organization. So if you start with one metric, like I said, very often MTTR driven by your incident response tool becomes a lot easier. You also can start looking at your Jenkins logs or your, your pipeline logs and looking at change failure rate, release velocity, et cetera, and add that functionality quickly. So that's it. Please reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you everybody who brought this event together. I love talking about this stuff. So if you wanna continue the conversation, please do. And have a fantastic day and enjoy the rest of the sessions. Bye-bye.